Analytical Philosophy Podcast. I'm Toby Buckle. About two years ago, I first had the idea for this podcast. I didn't really quite know what I was going to do, but I eventually decided that I'd do interviews. People wouldn't, I figured, be particularly interested in me just talking about political philosophy for any extended length of time. I didn't really know how to go about this, but I made a list of people who I thought might be interesting, and reached out to them. I was quite honest, I said, I didn't know how successful it would be, or if anyone would be into it. But nonetheless, I was very interested in their work, and would love it if they could come on. Some of the people, such as Michael Frieden, I knew before. I reached out to them, and then I just reached out to a selection of political philosophers. To somewhat my surprise, many of them agreed. Academics, I found, are wonderfully generous with their time. They will take an hour or two to do a call with you about their specific knowledge areas, out of nothing more than a passion for them and a desire for more people in the world to have knowledge. It's incredible, really. So I had this bunch of people. I recorded my first six or seven interviews altogether, and it didn't quite feel real until I realised I had a couple of days in which suddenly I would be discussing all these very deep and complicated issues with these incredibly impressive people. (laughs) And I remember feeling absolutely terrified. And honestly, those first two days are a complete blur. It was a proverbial roller coaster of emotions. I've lost track of all the details and, like, exactly which order I recorded my first few interviews in. It was all very fast-paced, two or three a day, though. Um, What I do remember very clearly, though, is the moment it clicked, and I was like, yeah, okay, this makes sense as a thing for me to do. And that's when I finished my first interview with Professor Cecile Farb. I just... You know, looking back on it now, there's all sorts of problems. Um, I hadn't got the hang of doing the introductions yet. I hadn't found my narrative voice, as podcasters sometimes call it. But it just felt right. It was a wonderful back and forth that I still think totally stands up when I go back and re-listen to it. And I made the first half of that conversation my premiere of the podcast The episode is called Sex Work, Organ Sales and Intuition, by the way. But yeah, I put that out there, and the rest, as they say, is history. It's been a year and a half later. The podcast has developed a following. We have thousands of people who tune in. We even have a small number of people who voluntarily fund the enterprise on Patreon, which I'm very grateful for, by the way. And so now that this podcast is everything I could have hoped it to be, and more, I even went and um, did some solo episodes, and people, again, somewhat to my shock, were genuinely interested in hearing me talk about, you know, political philosophy and political theory solo. But we've still stayed mostly focused on interviews. And so now that we have got it to the point where it's everything I could have possibly hoped it would be, it was a nice completing of the circle to have Professor Farb back on to discuss her latest book, Economic Statecraft. Professor Farb is a political philosopher and is currently Senior Research Fellow at All Souls College, Oxford. She's also Professor of Political Philosophy at the University of Oxford, and affiliated with the Faculty of Philosophy, the Department of Politics and International Relations, and Nuffield College. She's just completed an eight-year-long project on the ethics of war and peace, and since then she's been working on the ethics of foreign policy, with a particular focus on the ethics of economic statecraft on the one hand, and the ethics of espionage on the other. Her single-authored works include Social Rights Under the Constitution, Whose Body Is It Anyway? Justice and the Integrity of the Person, which was the topic of uh, the first half of my first interview with her, Justice in a Changing World, Cosmopolitan War, 
cosmopolitan peace and economic statecraft, human rights, sanctions and conditionality, which was the primary subject of this interview. This is going to be a two-part series, even with the proviso that I'm leaning towards longer episodes of an hour, maybe even a bit more than an hour in some cases. We still laid down enough material for at least two, so I'm just going to do two back-to-back. Those two episodes do track a single sustained argument, though, so it might be quite good to listen to them both together if you have the time. In the first part, we start from the beginning and lay out a theory of what rights are. We then build up to talk about property rights, to talk about the case for free trade, and to talk about instances where we might put restrictions on those rights and freedoms, namely in the cases of applying sanctions to protect human rights, and in conditional aid and in conditional lending. In the second part, we'll talk about state catcraft more generally. We'll talk about the theoretical and practical obstacles to enforcing rights globally. And we'll ask, can powerful actors such as the United States try and enforce rights through these mechanisms, given that it's often very hypocritical of them to do so, given that they themselves are often the perpetrators of human rights abuses. So that's what we're going to cover in this. The first half of the argument will be in this one, and then the second half of the argument I'll just put out next week. As a quick proviso, I'll say for the for the course of this conversation, I sort of pretend to be a deontologist or a rights theorist. If you want to hear me trade meta-ethical intuitions with Professor Farb, we do that in the first episode, but for this it seemed sensible to me to sort of accept that um, rights were the framework of the discussion that we're having. Although I don't think I say anything that contradicts my personal beliefs, I'm just using a different language and structure to express them in. As always, if you enjoy the podcast, please do share it on your own social media. All of that wonderful growth I've just talked about was organic and the result of people sharing episodes. And if you are able to support in a more monetary way, please do consider sponsoring us on Patreon. I don't do any advertisements at all. I think big, deep, sustained conversations like this one are spoilt by being interrupted by advertisements, so all of the costs associated with the podcast are funded by listeners, which is amazing, so I'm very grateful for that. And if you are able to do so, please check out patreon.com stroke political philosophy podcast for more information about how you can support. With that said, let's get straight to it. I really respect Professor Farb and always enjoy my conversations with her. As you'll hear, we're not just giving you rehearsed lines, but really grappling with ideas in real time. And in this one, you'll definitely hear me, because I am not and I do not pretend to be, particularly knowledgeable about the political philosophy of foreign policy, you'll hear me grappling with ideas and trying to make sense of them in real time. So yeah, I hope you get as much out of it as I did. And with that as preamble, let's get started. It is my absolute pleasure to bring you back to the podcast, Professor Cecile Farb. I am joined today by Professor Cecile Farb. Professor, thanks so much for coming back on. You're very welcome. It's a pleasure to be back. You were our first ever interview that we released on this show 18 months ago. Well, it was a honour um, at the time, and it still is an honour now to participate. No, I've, I've definitely looked um, forward to having you back on. And we said before we came on, it seems like, whoa, that was just 18 months ago. That's right, yes. 
Let's start um, with your latest book, Economic Statecraft, which pursues the morality of sanctions against other states. Just to begin with, then, what, what, if you could maybe describe your intellectual trajectory that led you to taking on this topic as something you thought was important. So, uh, good. So, um, as you and some of the listeners, you know, we know, um, I spent um, quite a few years uh, developing and defending an account of the ethics of uh, going to war, um, as well, in fact, of the ethics of negotiating and concluding a peace, you know, after war. Um, and um, in so doing, I, of course, had to grapple, you know, constantly with the normative possibility, as it were, that under certain you know, conditions, a decision to go to war or a way to prosecute a war are unjust or you know, morally wrong. For example, when the decision to go to war uh, and or the way in which uh, the war would be waged um, are disproportionate measures you know, relative to the wrongdoing which the war is seeking to thwart. Or you know, worries to the effect that War is not the option of last resort, um, or that war, you know, would be an ineffective way of thwarting uh, or redressing, you know, the wrongdoings at issue. And so, with that in mind, um, the question that naturally arose when I finished the project on war and peace is the question of alternatives to war, um, or as it is sometimes um, uh, said, force short of war. I mean, I prefer alternatives to war. Uh, because not all alternatives to war, of which you know, sanctions are, are forceful means of um, uh, pursuing one's just cause, that is of thwarting, blocking the rights violations at issue. Now, you said in your preliminary comments that the book, Economic Statecraft, uh, is about economic sanctions. To some extent, that's true, but it's only partly true, since two of the chapters in the book are given over not to economic sanctions, but to conditional offers of economic you know, assistance. So let me backtrack you know, a little bit. Um, as a matter of fact, if you look at uh, the ways in which states in general, and particularly you know, Western democracies as well as international you know, organizations, pursue their policy objectives, you know, vis-a-vis -vis one another, war is um, the least deployed option, you know, for those actors. More often than not, and certainly it seems to me more often than uh, the resort to war, they resort to economic instruments, of which there are many, but, you know, the many important ones are economic sanctions on the one hand, and on the other hand, conditional lending and conditional giving. So the book really tries to investigate the ways in which those different kinds of economic instruments are employed, as a matter of fact, but much more importantly, may justifiably or ought to be employed as a means to pursue you know, foreign policy objectives in those cases in which war is not a morally acceptable option. So that, in a nutshell, is what the book is trying to do. And it seems to me to be an important question, um, uh, precisely because, uh, to reiterate, as a matter of fact, you know, it's much closer to the reality of the ways in which you know, foreign policies are conducted. It's not something which has been very much studied by political philosophers. I think it's high time that there should be more research you know, along those lines. That's why I wrote that book. And that's why I also welcome, you know, uh, other books of that kind, one of which, you know, in particular by my colleague James Pattison at the University of Manchester, who just, you know, published a book called Alternatives to War. If the, this is a normative book, then you're not looking at like, you know, did this particular, or not primarily looking at did this particular instance of sanctions or conditional aid was it effective? You're looking at, are they justifiable, period? I mean, I do use empirical examples as much as I can, but you're right. Um, you know, my, my aim as a philosopher, you know, is to um, develop what one might call an account of just and unjust economic statecraft. So then if we're looking at that, I guess 
But if we're looking at what's right in this case, there's a few questions that would seem to me as arising from that. The first would be we'd want to develop an account of rights and property rights in particular, because when looking at economic interventions, those are the moral claims, either for or against, that people are going to rest most heavily on. In the case of foreign policy particularly, we would also have to look at how those rights might be enforced, That's um, right. given that we don't know actually what the outcome will be a lot of the time. And finally, there would be the question of who has moral standing. Does Is the US, after its many crimes and misdeeds, the right agent to enforce claims yeah. of yeah. rights around the world? So let's start with... Well, let me ask you just a really basic question, but one that people often seem to struggle with. What, what do we mean when we invoke rights? Is there a simple one or two sentence definition that we can give of what a right is? So I, I take the view, which is not particularly original, it's a fairly standard one, that um, you know, rights protect interests so that to say that some uh, being, some uh, agent, some entity, you know, has a right in respect of X, you know, is to say that that being, that agent, that entity has a interest in X being respected or promoted and an interest that's important enough to hold third parties under a duty not to attack, harm, undermine, you know, those interests. Um, so that, that particular account of rights has been developed by, you know, inter alia, Joseph Raz in The Morality of Freedom, you know, in particular. Um, so, so it's not just that we say, oh, one ought not to harm X. One says more strongly is that, were we to harm X, you know, the interest bearer would have a very strong grievance, you know, against us. We wrong that being, that entity, that agent, you know, by so acting, and we owe them, you know, something as a result. Okay. The, so we won't get into this here. Um, I've always, as you know from my last conversation, had more morally consequentialist intuitions, but the way I've made sense of rights claims is almost like as a protective capsule around those attributes which we deem essential to the functioning and flourishing of a human being, something like yeah. that. Yes, I think, that's a, I think that's a fair way to put it. Um, the reason I'm slightly hesitant is because it's not entirely clear to me that the language of protection um, uh, aptly captures rights to be provided with assistance. So, you know, um, it's not clear to me that if I say I have a right uh, to food you know, against you, um, it does mean that actually um, uh, you owe me protection in the sense that you ought not to interfere with me as I try to go and get food, you know, myself. However, if we want to say more strongly that you owe it to me to give me mm. food, um, the language of protection doesn't seem quite right, you know, there. So the way I think about this is... I say protection of attributes, not protection of persons. So there's the positive-negative rights distinction. But I would say, in order to function and flourish, a human being needs food, right? I mean, that's yes. actually just like one of the most, you know, to literally sustain life, we need food, right? So if that's ineliminatable for us li li living a functioning and flourishing life, we want to put a protective capsule around that attribute and say people should have food if it can be provided to them. And then that protection can take the form of social convention, morality, legality, linguistics, so on and so forth. That's good. Yeah, no, so, so that I'm with you, you know, on that one. That's good. Okay, because let's move on then to property rights, because property <laughs> rights are often set in, in contemporary political discourse in opposition to welfare yes. rights. Like the claim on the political right would be, yeah, you know, we all want you to have food, but you can't forcibly take my money from me to give it to you because that would be violating my property rights. So so this is this is important. So so um I agree that traditionally the two sets of rights, property and welfare, 
uh, have been set in a position to each other. Um, uh, they are in a position to each other, you know, in the sense that, uh, on my view, and um, it's a view which I've tried to defend in much earlier work, my property rights over my money, to put it simplistically, simplistically stop, you know, at your right, you know, to assistance where the best way. You know, for me to uh, provide you with assistance is to give you money. Um, nevertheless, um, I think it's important not to lose sight of the fact um, that even a lot of people on the left um, have acknowledged. I have in mind Jerry Curran, you know, who um, is not exactly known for having been a right, you know, rabid um, uh, right wing, you know, libertarian. Um, it's important not to do sense of the fact that property rights do protect, in fact, important interests, you know, of ours. Um, so to flesh out the claim you know, a little bit more, um, I do have an interest in, you know, uh, autonomy, uh, in being able to frame, revise, pursue a conception of the good, you know, with which I identify. Now, it seems to me that I cannot do so unless I have some control over some amount and some range of, you know, material, you know, resources, you know, the kind of control which property rights, you know, standardly confer, you know, on, uh, you know, on agency. If I have to um, ask you for your permission, you know, whenever I want to use any of the things which I do need to use in order to give up my life, um, then whatever autonomy I have, you know, will be nugatory, will not be worthwhile, um, since every time I have to check in, you know, with you. Uh, so it's in that sense that I think that, you know, property rights are uh, important. Um, I, I try to make sense of, you know, I try to explain why along those lines, you know, in, uh, you know, in the book. But as I also make it very clear, you know, those rights are only pro tanto rights. So not only, as I've just said, you know, are they uh, limited or constrained, you know, by your right, you know, to material, you know, assistance. But in addition, I can forfeit my property rights, um, you know, over, you know, my resources. So if I use those resources um, in, a, in a wrongful way, um, then we might argue that I don't have a right to control, you know, my resources in this particular way. That's a constraint on my property rights. By analogy, you have a right to bodily autonomy, but that would be forfeited if exactly. you go around assaulting people or something. That, that's exactly right. And finally, we might also argue that my property rights might be defeated by wager, you know, considerations. So one of the most famous examples is Joel Feinberg's, you know, example of a cabin uh, in the blizzard. So I'm lost in a blizzard. Uh, I will die unless I find a shelter very soon. And lo and behold, I stumble, you know, upon your shelter. Uh, but it's locked. So the only way I can, you know, get in is to break the lock, um, which I do, and I then consume, you know, the bread and the firewood that I find there. And on Feinberg's view, you know, I have an overriding justification for infringing your property rights, you know, of uh, the cabin, the food, the lock, you know, and, um, you know, and the firewood. Um, so, so these are the, the different ways in which, you know, property rights uh, can be limited, but however limited they are, they nevertheless remain important. So that's my main, you know, theoretical, you know, reason for um, uh, framing them in this way, you know, in the book, rather defending them in the book in this way. And the log cabin situation is just the situation we are in in society writ large, in that even just within our own states, there are people who are starving, and there are people yes. who are in need of assistance and of shelter, that's and right. there's huge concentrations of capital that could accommodate that. So that is, it's not one of these like complete hypothetical things that only philosophers think about. That is just the situation we're all in. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Now, I completely agree with you. Um, the Kevin example I find problematic because, unlike Feinberg, um, I don't think that um, this is a case where um, I have a, a weightier reason or a case where there is a overriding consideration which justifies in the form of my need for survival, which justifies my infringing, you know, your right. I mean, I think this is a case where actually 
you know, if you were on the scene, you would be under a duty to give me access you know, to your cabin. So that, to my mind, is more of a case where you would act wrongly by refusing you know, to help me. So I want to say in this particular case that with you absent you know, from the scene, or with you present but refusing to let me in, when I do break in and when I do use the resources you know, in question, I do not wrong you. You do not have a grievance you know, against me. Um, you know, these are the resources which you ought to have given to me you know, in the first instance. Now, this is different from cases where you would, be, you would not be wronging me by refusing to help me, but I may nevertheless proceed on the understanding that because by refusing to help me, you would not be wronging me, I owe you something once I have completed you know, the action. So let me give you, let me give you an example. And I, I mean, this is a, a point that matters in the book because I try to show that you know, there are cases where there might be a justification for infringing you know, on property rights, um, cases in which the property rights holder is not guilty of a wrongdoing by refusing to help, but when nevertheless we may proceed and ride roughshod you know, over their rights. So, you know, the example to illustrate the point in the cabin type you know, setting you know, would be um, one where um, if um, I were to uh, go into the cabin, I would have to step over you. Suppose that you are there, you are lying there, you're not in any danger. But the only way for me to get in is you know, to step over you in such a way that I would inflict some harm you know, on you. Now, we can imagine a situation where you are not under a duty yourself to allow yourself to incur that harm. I nevertheless, I therefore wrong you by so acting. But my need is such you know, that I'm morally justified you know, in so doing. So one way, you know, to uh, uh, frame the distinction is to say, well, look, you know, there are cases where, where I ha- when I harm you, I violate your right. I, I'm under a duty not to act in such a way. Um, there are cases where, where I harm you. I do not violate, you know, your right, nor do I infringe it. You simply did not have that right in the first instance. And then there are cases where you retain the right, but I nevertheless have an overriding justification for acting in this way. Does Uh, that make sense? Yeah, it does. So I think just in terms of to get back to absolute basics, though, although you've acknowledged like a number of constraints on property rights and instances in which they might not be operative, there is, at the heart of your work, a justification for them as a good thing. But I want to just separate out your justification for for them from... Because I think people on the left particularly are suspicious of claims about property rights, and I think they're suspicious because they often tend to be accompanied by two other sets of claims, which I think are much more spurious. Um, the first is claims about desert and what people deserve, and that people are people ought to have their property, that they've earned it in virtue of being a particular intelligent or hardworking or so on. I think those claims are not only empirically untrue, in that right. it just tends not to be the case that people with huge fortunes have amassed them virtuously, but also even under idealised circumstances, I'm not sure how far those claims could hold up. The oh. second is... So on the one hand, they're saying you have a right to your property because you should be rewarded for your industry and hard work and intelligence. That seems to me less defensible. What we're saying is it's good that you have exclusive control over a certain set of things because so doing allows you to autonomously pursue your own life plan and flourish in your own way. Those One seems a solid argument and one doesn't to me. The other claim which follows on from that is... It seems to me like a lot of people want to make the claim, not only that we have um, property rights, but that those rights are so strong and so over... that they overwhelm any other rights or any other welfare consideration, the Nozak position, right? And I don't 
understand that, actually. I don't... Not only do I not, not agree with th that it's justified, I don't understand what the justification for it could possibly be if rights are a protection or an expression of our what is most essential for human beings to flourish. I can see that that's a part of it. I can't see that it's the whole deal, and I, I don't understand but, even what argument I, could establish that. So... Yeah, so, so I mean, I, I, I agree with your scepticism. I mean, as you know, of course, um, you know, Nozick appeals to self-ownership, you know, to justify, you know, the, the kind of, you know, property rights of the world, um, you know, that um, uh, he articulates and sets out in Anarchy Study in Utopia. Uh, you know, others, I mean, again, particularly Jerry Cohen, have shown us saying that self-ownership is really not going to get you there. Um um, you know, this this might not be the time, you know, to rerun the entire argument. I suppose. No, no, that was just a um, a, a note as to why yeah. I think there is a lot of scepticism about property rights and why yeah. the justification that you're appealing to here is separate from justifications to eat for either desert or just well, this overriding yeah. monolithic view that property rights are the only rights and the yes. only ones. And I was, yeah. yeah, so that, these are just claims I can't, I can't see how the arguments that are forwarded for them are supposed to get you the result. So I, I would agree with you that, but nevertheless, um, I, I do think that um, uh, you know, speaking, you know, uh, from the point of view of and to the left, um, you know, scepticism, you know, about standard arguments in favour of property rights. You know, should not lead us, I think, to um, uh, occlude, overlook, um, you know, the, the claim, that, um, in fact, the fact, I think it is a fact, that, you know, exclusive control, you know, up to a point is absolutely crucial. So, I mean, that's, that's to autonomy. Um, uh, now, that's in my you know, normative or, you know, theoretical justification for um, starting with property rights, you know, in the book. Um, but I have another one, you know, which is a, a practical, uh, well, so much practical, but strategic, um, you know, reason, um, you know, which is that um, it's it, uh, both harder, but I think also more interesting to try and justify, you know, the practice of imposing, you know, economic sanctions. Um, if you start, you know, with the assumption that property rights are important than if you don't. And that's because even though economic sanctions are generally targeted at, in the context of economic statecraft at state actors, you know, they do operate quite often against private you know, economic actors who will be very quick you know, to say that you know, economic sanctions um, impede uh, uh, undermine, you know, violate their right freely, you know, to trade with whomever you know they wish. Uh, you know, if if you if you don't believe that uh, property rights, by which you know we mean, and we should have been clearer about that from the very beginning, by which we mean private, you know, property rights. I mean, if if you believe that, you know, they cannot under any circumstances be, you know, justified. Um, if you believe, in other words, that uh, publicly owned um, or public ownership you know, of the world resources is what is required by justice, then you won't have any difficulties you know, with defunding economic sanctions against private economic actors, since those actors do not have, on my view, any claim of ownership you know, in justice over those resources. Right, right. The case for sanctions becomes easier if you're a hardline socialist or communist, right? What I wanted, what I wanted to do in the book you know, in the first part of the book was to say, well, even if, you know, you are committing yourself, you know, to broadly speaking, you know, property, private property rights, you know, in particular, but capitalism, you know, and the market, you know, in general, even if, you know, you commit yourself to that um, view, um, then there are very good reasons as to why you should accept, you know, economic sanctions, you know, under certain, you know, conditions. Um, incidentally, um, you know, there is a similar strategic consideration uh, in play when it comes to rights to assistance. I mean, as I said earlier, I don't simply um, I believe that um, we have a case for property rights. I also think that there is a, a strong case for rights to economic assistance. Um, there is a strong normative case for those rights. 
Uh, but there is a strategic reason you know, for um, uh, setting those whites out at the beginning of the book, which is that it's more interesting as well as more difficult you know, to argue in favor of conditional you know, assistance. Um, you know, if you think that there is a right you know, to welfare assistance, if you don't think that there is a right to welfare assistance, you know, if you think that it's just a matter of charity, you know, whether the rich help the poor, then you would have no difficulty you know, in justifying the imposition of condition, you know, on the delivery of assistance. But if you think there is a right to assistance, then it's harder, you know, to show, and I think more interesting, you know, to show that um, you know, the respect for that right can be conditioned, you know, upon the fulfilment of certain you know, obligations. Let's just clarify the ground we've covered thus far, then. Yeah. We've defined what a right is, and... We've said it's, you didn't like the word protection, but it, it's it's a respect for and a demand that others respect those yeah. attributes of a person that are essential for their functioning and flourishing, something okay. like that. We've okay. said that that can entail or does entail exclusive control over a certain set of things, that that is needed for our autonomy, but that isn't the only game in town and that right... That's- is only operative as far as other demands of justice on that person are met. Yeah. But assuming other demands of justice have been met and there's not special circumstances arising, the default would be if I own a book and you own money and you want to exchange money for the book and I do too, that's not only unproblematic, but that's normative. That's an exercise of our autonomy. That's right. That's very good. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, building up from that, then, the norm would be that there would be at least a section of the economy and society in which markets transactions can take place. And the norm would be internationally, the sort of moral default would be a regime of free trade, building up from that. That's right. Um, That's right. so constrained by the demands of justice. So I, I don't want to to say, and if I argue against the view that uh, trade should be completely free, I mean, you know, the, 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 the whole point of economic sanctions is to restrict, you know, free trade, you know, on certain grounds. And what I want to argue in the book um, is that, um, you know, economic sanctions as a means to um, uh, thwart ongoing you know, human rights violations or to deter mm. you know, doers from committing such violations in the future, those sanctions are you know, justified. And to repeat, uh, yes, go on. But you assume the burden of proof is sort of, at least insofar as you're developing this argument, you assume yes, the I... burden of proof is against you. You assume that if you have two states, wonderful magical utopias in which all rights are respected, then the norm should be that both of their governments allow the free exchange of goods and services between those states. And again, you know, to repeat, I have two grounds for making that assumption. One is a, a theoretical ground. You know, it, it, you know I, I, I have that intuition that that is the default, um, that is the baseline, or that, to put it more philosophically, that there is a presumption, um, a moral presumption in favour of uh, free trade, which, like um, all... Um, which, which is um, an example of a wider presumption in favour of freedom, such that you know the burden of proof you know, is on those who seek you know to restrict. Um, uh, the converse of that, you know, to anticipate is that when it comes to assistance, the burden of proof is on those who wish to condition assistance or to withhold you know assistance. Um, and again, you know, I have. Uh, a normative commitment, you know, to place the burden of proof where I place it, but a strategic commitment as well. It's just more interesting mm. to investigate, um, you know, what follows, you know, with respect to sanctions on the one hand and assistance on the other hand, once we have those two presumptions in place. Yeah, th- so this is another slight aside that we needn't be driven down, but like, a, a commitment to free trade with the important, you know, demands of justice have been met qualifier is one of the few areas where I've always sort of thought of myself as more politically right wing. Although what with Trump's I, ridiculous t- trade wars, I don't know I, if that even is a right wing commitment well, anymore. Yeah. But 
I don't see... I think sometimes people on the left feel as if, you know, a factory job, you know, is taken away from New Mexico and put in Mexico. A grave moral injustice has been done. And I don't know that de facto you can say that an American worker has more right to a particular standard of living than a Mexican worker. Like, there might be strategic and political economy considerations we would want to bring in. And certainly, I think we should be sceptical of concentrations of corporate power. But that's a question of governance, which is separate from questions of, like, nationalism and a particular people being owed something, you know? So, um, uh, so, so I have two points in the part. One is that, again, I mean, I agree... Um, that um, with your you know, Mexican versus American worker example, um, uh, I, I agree that um, individuals' fundamental entitlements should not be are not uh, morally speaking you know dependent on their nationality or on which country they happen to reside um, in and so on and so forth. Um, second, however, you, you find that governance is interesting because um, it seems to me that. Um, uh, you, know, you know, worries about concentration of corporate power, or you know, worries about the strategic payoff of articulating the cosmopolitan view, um, or rather the nationalist view, are not just practical governance worries. I mean, you know, they are underpinned by you know normative commitments, you know, about, in particular, you know, the relative weight you know to be given to strategic, you know, practical effectiveness considerations, um, you know, um, uh, as against uh, deeper, you know, uh, moral considerations such as, you know, the ego status of the Mexican worker and the American worker. Does that make sense to you, what I've just said? So, maybe not, actually. Um, So, we agree on equal status, right? But then um, what you're saying is the questions of corporate power are both practical and normative insofar as who ought to have that power and who should be, maybe I'm misunderstanding, who who should be constrained by it. So no, I think there's a lot of normative questions at the heart of like, who has power and why? And I don't think that's contained merely to government structures. I think that's applicable wherever power okay. is. So I think we were. So I, I think we were at cross purposes here. So yeah, um, I yeah, think help you me just out. Say, I think you just say, well, you know, as a matter of principle, um, there is no reason why an American worker, qua American worker, should have better opportunities than a Mexican, you know, worker, qua Mexican worker. However, there might be, you know, strategic, you know, reasons as to why, as a matter of public policy. You know, we or our leaders, you know, should not articulate, you know, that view. Well, let me um, no. Let me let me put it this way. It, um, take a specific free trade agreement like NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Right. It might be that that has two consequences which are morally at cross purposes. One of which right. is morally good, and one of which is morally bad. The morally right. or morally neutral, at least one, might be that jobs that Americans have are now held by Mexicans. Right. Assuming it's the same number and the same utility trade-off, that seems okay. to me morally neutral. The other okay. one might be that that free trade operates in such a way as um, you know small concentrations of corporate power become yet more powerful and that would be normatively bad for a variety of reasons we needn't get into about accountability of governance yeah okay that makes more sense and i don't see the anything that i can disagree with so yes good i just wanted to separate that out because i think a lot of the time when you make the case for free trade what people want to think about is that other case about corporate power um, which so, you could, in theory, have one without the other, is what I'm saying. So, um, uh, so at the risk of undermining myself, uh, but for the sake of honesty, um, you are pressing here on you know, a criticism which um, I've often encountered, you know, when presenting the arguments, uh, which I think is a is a fair, you know, criticism, namely that um, you know the account of rights that I propose in general and of uh, free trade in particular. Um, is not sensitive, is, is um, overly individualistic and, um, as a result, not sensitive enough um, to, um, 
the the multiplicative effect or impact, you know, as it were, um, the multiplicative harmful, you know, impact, you know, as it were, of uh, the exercise by individuals of their individual rights, um, which is a fancy way of saying, you know, what about groups, you know, what about companies, um, and so on and so forth. Now, I think it's a fair point. Um, it's not a point that um, I was able to deal with well, um, I think, in the book, um, partly because in order to deal with it well, um, I would have, one would have to have a fully developed uh, moral and political theory of um, the business, the farm, you know, the corporation. And that's a serious gap, actually, in contemporary political philosophy. I mean, it's... I completely some, agree. Yeah, I mean, you know, some, some people, you know, are, some scholars are beginning you know, to think about it, you know, quite, quite carefully. Um, I haven't yet, but that's something which I hope to do, you know, at some point. Yeah, but at any rate, you could say for present purposes that exactly. concerns about governance and corporate power are concerns about governance and corporate power, yes. primarily. Yes. You know? Primarily. And yes. the, the free trade thing, you, you might, in some ways it might be an idealistic argument that's not fully in line with the way the world really works, but that yeah. idealistic argument can stand on its own two feet. Yeah, I think so. Um, or at least I hope so as well, because, you know, um, it's the starting point for the book. So, yes. But so then, if that is the norm, then your next move is to say, here are the cases in which we would not want to respect that That's norm. Right. That's right. Um, so cases in which um, uh, the resources that are the goods um, that are being traded um, you know, are used, you know, to uh, commit or in the commission of uh, serious, you know, violations of human or fundamental, you know, rights. So let's just, let me um, just invite you to make that case then. Um, yeah, so, so the thought, I mean, you know, I mean, this one is really very simple, you know, embarrassingly, you know, simple. Um, um, you know, the thought is that um, to give an individual, you know, analogy, um, you know, if, um, you know, some agent, you know, wants to buy a gun from another agent, you know, in order to commit uh, a murder, um, then there is a case for saying that the prospective buyer, you know, does not have a claim, you know, to be allowed to exercise his or her property rights over his money in order to buy that gun. And likewise, um, the prospective seller, you know, does not have a claim to um, uh, exercise control, you know, over his gun by selling it, um, you know, given that the gun, you know, will be used, you know, to commit, you know, to commit murder. So, so what I try and do in the book is show that this is what economic well, that's one way in which we can justify, you know, economic sanctions. Um, an interference in, you know, in um, uh, exchange, commercial, you know, exchanges writ large, you know, with a view to thwarting the rights violations which would be enabled, you know, by those exchanges. That's one justification for sanctions. There is another one, you know, which appeals to deterrence, uh, which takes a, a different form, um, uh, but the, 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 the simpler one, you know, is the one that I've articulated to you. The grounds of that are quite narrow, though. That would be like um, Saudi Arabia is doing all sorts of evil things. Their capacity to do those evil things will be greater if they have more military aircraft. Yeah. Therefore, if you are producing and selling military aircraft, I can, although Western governments never seem, do seem to do this, Yes. Um, I then would be justified in restricting your freedom to sell yeah. those military yeah. aircraft. Yes. yes. So that's the simpler. That's the very simple case. Now, of course, so we we, we know that um, you know sanctions are tend to be much broader uh, in scope, you know, than um, this simple example you know suggests. Uh, they're broader, you know, in different ways. So first of all. They um, uh, quite often don't don't target only you know the precise you know purchasers of those resources or indeed sellers of those resources. Um, by which by purchaser I mean you know, the companies which will buy the resources and which will then make or sell on you know those resources to 
uh, to dictators, uh, or to political regimes. Um, quite often, you know, sanctions have been uh, uh, applied against much wider, you know, categories of people. So, you know, that has been the worry uh, about the uh, sanctions program that was adopted in the aftermath of the first Gulf War, you know, against uh, against Iraq, you know, where, you know, a number of ordinary, you know, Iraqis, um, uh, and indeed, you know, in current settings, ordinary Palestinians, for example, to give another example of sanctions, you know, are denied, you know, access, um, you know, to goods which on the face of it have very little to do, you know, with the human rights violations, you know, which the sanctions are seeking. You know, to um, you know, to combat, to eliminate. I can imagine, though, from a real politique view, that someone who has to actually make those decisions could say, you know, well, look, Professor Fab, you have all of your fancy philosophy, and I agree, it would, you know, be more justifiable in the case of, yeah, don't give the the murderer another gun, right? But right. the case is that maybe he already has enough guns, and that these more justifiable and less invasive measures are simply not going to cut it in the real world. And if we want to affect behaviour, we have to really put the squeeze on in a way that's going to have a lot of, uh, maybe not as much as war, but still nonetheless very real collateral damage to it. So I think that's interesting. So 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 it's true um, that um, uh, first a lot of people worry about the effectiveness you know, of sanctions, even when they are narrowly, you know, defended in the way that I just have done. Um, uh, and it's also true, you know, that as a matter of fact, um, therefore it's not really clear that um, uh, you know diminishing the amounts of uh, shipments, you know, of arms to various regimes, you know, will um, uh, help combat um, the uh, human rights violations of which those regimes are guilty. I don't think it follows, however, that sanctions are morally unjustified. So there we might have, you know, a different, we might want to appeal to a different kind of uh, justification. So again, you know, let's have a look at a simple, you know, individual, um, uh, you know, domestic you know, example. So, you know, the fact that my local, uh, the local gang leader, you know, already has a number of guns at his disposal from which he can choose, you know, to murder, you know, his next victim, does not, it seems to me, constitute a reason as to why I may not be prohibited from selling him his 10th, 11th, 12th gun. You know, we might argue that, in fact, I ought not to sell him yet another gun, you know, given the kind of, you know, uh, operation, you know, which he's running. And that if I were, nevertheless, you know, out of considerations of profit, for example, you know, seek to sell him that gun, third parties, you know, might have a justification for interfering. But, okay, so we are, we are agreed that you should right. not be selling your, your, your gang leader yet another gun. So that's both of our plans for the weekend ruined. Um, but, but, okay, so we've agreed. We'll take that as our default, yeah. and that's fine. But then it nonetheless is the case that the gang leader already has ten guns and what? is already, you know, is still going to keep killing people. You know, we, we're not selling him more, but that's still ongoing. The question would be then, if we can't apprehend that gang leader, would it then be justified to go and restrict the businesses that give him protection money and harm innocent bystanders as an instrumental way of bringing him to justice, accepting that we can't give him more guns? Good. Yeah, that's good. So, so, so in this, that's that's good. So, in those cases in which. Um, uh, you know, the fact that we make it difficult or impossible for him to procure the more guns will not impede him in his unjust, you know, endeavor, you know, killing, you know, his opponents. You know, that fact um, should lead us to think about uh, other means which we may justifiably employ, you know, to stop him. But the fact that um, there might be other means, you know, for him to, um, for, for us to employ, you know, to stop him is, in my view, compatible you know, with the claim that there nevertheless is a justification, you know, for, uh, there, there is support for the view that I ought not, 
you know, to um, to somehow make myself complicitous or not so much complicitous. I ought not, you know, to interact with him, you know, in this way. I ought not to sell index to gun. Now, um, the, the, the point is important because um, it leads me to to see perhaps more clearly than I did that although I frame you know, the argument about economic sanctions or in favor of economic sanctions as an argument about uh, alternatives to war, uh, in fact, um, in some cases, economic sanctions are not an alternative you know, to war. Ex hypothesis I, you know, in this case, they're not an alternative to war simply because A, they don't work, B, work might work better, but the fact that they are not an alternative to war, for the reasons just given, you know, is not enough you know, to ground a prohibition on sanctions. Does that make sense? So, in other words, the fact that there could be a situation in which war would not be justified, but sanctions might be. That there yeah. might be, like a Venn diagram, there might be an area in which one is normative and the other isn't. Yes, um, and there might also be cases where war is morally justified, but it doesn't follow, you know, from the claim that war is morally justified, that economic sanctions, you know, are ipso facto unjustified. You know, they might be justified, but on grounds other than preventing this particular actor from committing human rights violations. They might be justified, and I, I have a few paragraphs about that in the book, they might be justified on a symbolic, mm. you know, um, and they might be also, I mean, they might be justified, you know, on deterrence, you know, grounds. Right. So we should not succeed in stopping that actor, you know, from committing human rights violations, but our determination so to act vis-a-vis -vis him even if we do not succeed in impeding him, might serve as a deterrent, you know, to other actors who otherwise, you know, right. would be tempted, you know, to uh, commit human rights violations if you're in the knowledge that they would have access to our resources via free trade. Though, so there's cases in which neither would be justified. Mm -hmm. There's cases in which sanctions alone might be justified. <laughs> And then there's cases in which both might be justified, but yeah. they might be justified for different reasons. That's, that's right. That's absolutely right. Yeah, that's good. And in that latter case, then, the default would be towards sanctions rather than war, with the assumption that the collateral damage of sanctions, though real, is less than that of war. Well, so I don't want to commit myself to that view. So... so... It's not clear to me that um, economic sanctions, qua sanctions, uh, always impose less collateral damage than war, you know, qua war. I mean, I think it all depends on the breadth and scope, um, you know, of the sanctions, you know, relative to, likewise, the breadth and scope of war. So a very, very limited war, both in, in, in um, uh, spatial and uh, temporal terms, might be far less harmful, you know, to the innocent than an ongoing, decade-long, you know, program of economic sanctions. I'm reminded of... I don't know how true it is, and I've heard people contest it, but just say that it is true. I've heard various statistics that the economic sanctions in the case of Iraq through the 90s um, killed some meaningful fraction of a million people because of, like food yeah. and medical goods and services not getting through, which would make it actually comparable to the Iraq war itself. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you think of the Panama invasion in the yeah. early 90s, yeah. I think killed about 2,000 people, which is mm -hmm. uh, uh, orders of magnitude lower. So, yeah, okay, that, that point makes sense. That's perhaps too fast to say that. Yeah, I think, so I think that's a bit too fast. And also, I'm, I'm uh, trying to remember the, um, you know, the figure, you know, there uh, with respect to Iraq. But uh, for, for a number of years, the um, a number that was quoted was, I think, you know, something like um, uh, 500,000 uh, children, you know, died uh, as a result of the uh, the sanctions. Um, so there's I mean, a really there's a really famous moment with Madeleine Albright, the then Secretary yeah. of State, where someone says to her, and it was only ever meant as a hypothetical. They right. say, if half a million children were killed, would it be worth it? 
And she bites the bullet and says, yes, it would be worth it. And then later on, other people have gone back and said, whoa, actually, maybe that number wasn't right or whatever. But it just became a thing because there was this really famous moment where the American Secretary of State said, we are intentionally killing half a million children. And we think it's justified. Yeah, so there's been a a recent study in um, uh, one of the British medical journals uh, actually uh, rebutting you know, that precise, you know, number. But, you know, irrespective of the details of that particular case, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's important to get the numbers right. Um, but, you know, my, my focus here is on, um, you know, the claim that's very often made or sometimes made that uh, economic sanctions are a justified alternative to war on the grounds that they are less harmful, you know, to uh, innocent people than war is. And all I want to say is that it, it's not necessarily true, you know, in principle. So So in that case where both are justified then, you'd have to look, it wouldn't be my sort of crass, morally consequentialist case of war kills more people because that might not be true. It would be what are the justifications for both of those sets of actions and which are more compelling? How would you think about that then, when when both Uh become... On the table. Uh, so, so it depends on what you mean by justification. Um, I mean, I tend to draw, I want to draw a distinction between you know, having a justification for embarking on a particular course of action, you know, on the one hand, and on the other hand, there being constraining conditions, you know, on my um, permissible pursuit of that course of action. So, it, I might have a justification for attempting to kill my attacker you know, in self-defense, um, the justification takes the form, he attacks me without warrant, um, you know, that gives me a moral reason, a justification you know, for trying to, uh, to kill him in return. Um, that's different from saying that I am morally justified, all things considered, you know, in killing him in self-defense only if certain conditions are met. And one of the you know, important conditions uh, is a proportionality in a condition. So it's not clear to me that, you know, if I can defend myself from him only in such a way that 5,000 people would die as a result, I don't think I can, all things considered, you know, defend my life, you know, in this particular, uh, in this particular case. Um, you know, by parity of reasoning... Um, when we compare, you know, war and other measures, you know, we have to look not just at the justification, the primary reason, if you will, you know, for going to war and or for employing those other measures. You know, we have to look at how um, those two courses of action fare, you know, under those constraining conditions. And so with respect to war on the one hand and economic sanctions on the other hand, you know, proportionality is an important, you know, consideration. Um, so, for, you know, to illustrate, if you know a particular war, you know, would um, uh, result in, you know, say, two thousand civilians, you know, dying, whereas economic sanctions against the same uh, regime, you know, would occasion the death of twenty, you know, thousand, you know, civilians. Uh, well, then, you know, we have a potent reason. You know, to go to war, as opposed to resort to economic sanctions. Okay, so we've discussed the case for property rights as a default once the demands of justice are met, and we've right. discussed instances in which we might infringe on those rights for yes. another good, i.e. sanctions. But then there's the converse of that, which is we might be in a case of justly providing somebody assistance, but then make that conditional on some sort of other behaviour. Could you talk us through that argument? Good. So so, um, uh, the um, the ethics of conditional assistance um, is something which I um, spent quite a bit of time uh, on in the book, two chapters, you know, in fact. Um, so here, you know, the thought is this. Um, uh, contemporary theories of justice, particularly since wars, you know, have um, argued that under certain conditions, you know, agents have a strong claim uh, to have their needs met or 
to the resources necessary for them to reach, um, enjoy equality of opportunities or equality of outcome, and so on and so forth. Um, so in the in the language of you know human rights, um, the claim takes the form. You know, all individuals have, you know, um, welfare rights to minimum income, shelter, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, and what I'm interested in is, um, you know, whether or not um, it is morally permissible for those actors who are deemed under a duty to provide assistance to make the delivery of assistance conditional, you know, upon the beneficiary. You know, meeting certain you know conditions, um, and again, you know, when we talk about economic statecraft, I think it's a it's an important you know question, if only because, um, as we all know, states and international institutions resort to those measures all the time. So, for example, you know, um, a state might say, in fact, some states have said to another regime. Um, if you um, do not uh, rescind your um, homophobic you know, legislation, we will discontinue the aid that we have started you know, providing. Or they will say, we will give you, you know, material assistance, but only if you use it you know, to this or that end. Only if, for example, you... Uh, embark on the liberalization of your essential services or only if you use it for um, primary school programs. Mm. It's not a topic which uh, political philosophers have uh, talked about you know, very much um, at all. I'm not entirely sure why. I think it's an interesting topic in its own right as a, as a philosopher, um, and not just because you know, it's an important part of how international politics you know, functions. And one of the reasons why, you know, well, there are two reasons why I find it interesting. Um, one is that it's very easy to assume from a strong commitment you know, to distributive justice that its constitutive duties are unconditional. And I want to show that they are not, in fact. Second, um, there is a distinction to be drawn uh, as a matter of principle, and one that is ignored as well, I think, between providing assistance in the form of a gift, on the one hand, or aid, and on the other hand, providing it in the form of a loan. Um, these are very different, and I try to show in the book that um, conditions that we may justifiably attach to aid might not be the same as conditions that we may justifiably attach to giving a loan. What would, so be, the, what would be the distinction? Because I haven't thought about that question at all. But, so, so suppose, suppose that um, you, you really need money. Um, and, you know, suppose that um, I can give you some money, by which I mean I'm in a position. I have money at my disposal. Um, you know, however... If I were to give you, for free, as it were, the money at my disposal, the cost would be very high here to me. For example, I wouldn't be able to feed myself. Right. Now, most um, uh, philosophers who write about duties of distributive justice say that those duties are subject to a no and you sacrifice you know, proviso. You know, think about Singer and his paper on affluence and morality. Right. So in this particular case... You know, insofar as the cost of helping you would be very, very high, ex hypothesis to me, I'm not under a duty, we may argue, to give you the money. I suppose, however, that I can loan you, you know, the money, so you will be able to repay me. Now, it's unclear to me that I'm not under a duty to loan you the money under those circumstances. In fact, you know, we might want to argue that under some circumstances, I am under a duty to loan you the money in those cases in which the cost would not be so high to me and would not be so high precisely because you would repay me you know, the money you know, over a certain you know, amount of time. So the moral so, distinction is because the burden is decreased. It, it okay. makes it easier to clear the no one due burden hurdle. That's right. Um, that's right. There might also be cases where I'm not under a duty to give you the money. I'm not even under a duty to loan you the money. I'm only permitted you know, to loan you the money. But then there is a further question to be asked as to whether or not 
I am justified in imposing conditions on my giving you the beliefs, learning you the beliefs. Some people might argue that, uh, sure, I'm not obliged you know, to give you the money, to learn you the money. I'm only permitted to do it. But if I decide you know, to give it to you, I am morally prohibited from making it conditional, making the loan conditional on you doing certain things. Um, and, and I think there are interesting um, you know, questions to be explored, uh, which we won't have the time to do in this interview, you know, um, between the duty to aid, the duty to loan, um, the permission to impose which kind of conditions and uh, on which kind of you know, assistance. Um, that's relatively uncharted you know, territory. I mean, I would hope you know, one day to write you know, an article on this um, which unhinges those questions from the specific context of economic statecraft, you know, the context in which I address you know, them. Um, but that's as far as I've got you know, in the book.